Alrighty, thank you. Um, so, uh, for our final presentation of the afternoon, and then I just want to remind you, um, today, today only, we have another presentation. It's more of a, a dialogue. We're going to reset the room during dinner, so it's a circle. Um, so we're going to have a, a dialogue after dinner with, um, led by Glenn Perry. Um, but now, uh, from Santa Cruz, we have Ava Ryder, <laughs> who is talking about Jung, alchemy, and the tree of life, squaring the circle, and reanimating spirit in matter. That's a lot for a half an hour. <laughs> so, and it's been a circular process. Um, as I've mentioned, watching news and present and pulling this together. And I just want to say that the word that's really up for me right in this moment in time is the word redemption. And that fifth act. Um, and I'm really, uh, you know, hoping that we can, that vision of redemption is possible um, still. So um, in these days, I uh, begin with uh, unbalanced force, um, which is spread upon the land and sea and the air. Where do we find the hope, uh, that cosmic balance, perhaps the enantiodromia? Um, when will it come? Is there, is there time? And I understand, I'm not a Gebser scholar, but I understand from the A perspective view that it's all upon us, it's all here, it's present. So perhaps, perhaps it's not too late because um, it's, already, it's all already happened and we must reach backward and forward and awaken in the now. So, so from the standpoint of squaring the circle, bringing spirit into matter, it becomes a journey um, of coming home. Um, I, as perhaps we are still destined to be the stewards of the earth, as in the mythic tale of the Garden of Eden, and it points our way from the tree of good and evil, of opposites, uh, through a path of knowledge and a returning to coming home to who we are, stewards of this garden, which is our planet and ourselves. Um, so, our task is facing the shadow and drawing down the knowledge that is hidden within the unconscious, or perhaps it is more a memory than anything. There is a way. Um, as a synthesis, because I see myself more as a synthesis um, over, time, over time, linking systems. And truth is a key. And the keys link us to paths that unlock hidden doors. There is a way that hasn't anything to do with philosophy or paths trodden through the annals of history books and is a pathway that finds its wisdom through the energies of the body. The physical body and its language of elements, the astral body and its language of dreams and visions. But is there yet a higher order that seeks our awakening to its understanding? Who are we? What is our purpose? How is our perception of our destiny to be fulfilled as we struggle to balance the opposing forces of opposites and find a way to discover the dance of the opposites is the caduceus our own DNA, the serpent energy that links matter and spirit through soul. And soul, to discover itself, seems to need to find its way through an abyss, a spiral universe caught in its reflection of itself, moving between the worlds of the invisible and the invisible. So to begin, um, squaring the circle, um, is one of the, according as Jung's words um, from the Archetypes of Collective Unconscious, is one of the many archetypal motifs which form the basic patterns of our dreams and fantasies. But it is distinguished by the fact that it is one of the most important of them from the functional point of view. Indeed, it could even be called the arch archetype of wholeness. 
So uh, this particular image um, is, of course, from the Red Book. And we'll, as we move through some of the, my slides, which I've cut down, had to, <laughs> um, we hear, see here the circle and within it the cross of matter, um, which is a symbol. It's a mandala, but it's also a symbol that we see cross-culturally everywhere because it also symbolizes air, fire, earth, and water, which is matter itself. And so this image of drawing this down to this land and sea is uh, an amazing one. Fire, the primal fire to earth. So I'm going to move forward. Oh, I have one of these. Um, squaring the circle, this is We've been speaking a lot about the power of art, and always the artists are the ones who see ahead into the future. And um, this is uh, Squaring the Circle by uh, Jake Badley, who is a contemporary uh, painter and sculptor, um, obviously quite influenced um, by alchemy and by Jung. <laughs> so as many of you are familiar, this is the Kabbalistic, Hermetic, um, the tree of life. And if you fold the tree of life, I want to say, it does become a cube, <laughs> which is quite an extraordinary thing. Um, I do have a pointer, do I? Or is it something else? <laughs> How does that? It's the red dot. Under the, top. the red dot? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, it's not, I can't, uh, doesn't work. Okay, well the very top of the tree, and we'll be getting, I, I put up this image partially because the importance is that first whirling at the very top of the tree is the a point, the first point, the point of entry. Um, beyond that we have um, the limitless light, um, and that beyond it, the unlimited and eventually, and the void is behind that. And this is the first point of life, uh, light, which is the God, the, the spark, the beginning. And when we go across to where, from Keter, which is the crown, um, we, it also, okay, I'm going to, it also, this is a map. It's a map of cosmos and of psyche and of, and of matter or body. And so our task if our, is to bring this energy that is in the archetypal realm at the top of the tree down to the bottom where it's at with, in Malkut, which is 10, which is Earth. Um, and it's a spiral journey. So I just want to talk about moving to the right side on the tree because we're looking at it objectively. We can back into it um, subjectively. Is the um, energy actually connected to the zodiac, the great father, and it's uh, Hokma, which is the place of um, wisdom. Um, actually, it's wisdom and understanding. But in the two, we now have the linear, the self-reflective. We're now in dialogue. Um, so God has separated. <laughs> and from that, we move across to Bina. And I want to spend some time talking about this. Um, because this is the place of the great mother, and uh, negative and positive. And on the esoteric level, um, she is the creator and destroyer of form. And so we have both the dark on the archetypal level and the light. Um, and from this, um, this top triangle is the archetypal triangle. Um, and we then are going to move down through the abyss, through Doth, which is a place of hidden knowledge. Um, it's the desert. It's the place that we come through when we are born, when we die, through all any transformation. Um, and we pass through. And when we arrive at the other side, we burst into color. And we are in the plane of duality. And um, so, and from there we have this back and forth, um, which if you were looking at it from the top down, 
would be a spiral. If you're looking at it from the Earth up, again, it's a spiral universe. So, um, to continue on this particular, um, when we come down, um, all of these spheres, the sephira, uh, correspond, besides the chakra system on the physical level, they also correspond to planets. Um, so, uh, cosmologically and also to elements. So, um, so within this, the alchemical processes are embedded within the tree itself. And so, as we move down back and forth, when we arrive at the number six, this is the mediator, this is the place of soul. And, um, and from this place, um, we can begin to move um, this uh, back and forth from spirit at the top, soul, body. Now this area, the nine, the yesod, is called foundation. Um, on the psychological level, it can be the ego, but it's also the astral plane. It's the plane, the plane of the realm of uh, dreams, where um, there's much to say, and I'm hoping I don't forget so one of the things that's really significant about looking at the tree also is when you cross that abyss, that doth is the abyss, and you're looking at, you're at it from this triangle, I'm just going to move this triangle, it's the exact opposite. It's a reflection of the top triangle. So it's a direct reflection. So all that we experience here is actually a reflection of what is outside of this time and space. Um, and then we move closer and closer in, uh, towards Earth into um, becomes more dense. So C. So this is the one I use, although it doesn't have the numbers, um, but it also doesn't show the um, limit, limitless light and the void behind it. Um, but what I love about it this particular, it's on the, of course, it's, it's on the flower of life. Um, but also that at Malkuth, at the bottom, you can really see that it's become the colors are denser, whereas we're closer to matter. And so if you were standing back into the tree, you would be embodying this dance that moves back and forth. Um, so it's not, you know, so when we think about duality, it's not necessarily a split, although it can be, it's, or the masculine and the feminine, yin and yang, um, force and form, um, it's a dance. Um, so we'll see what else can be said about that. Okay, so a few more things is I'm just going for those of you who are astrologically inclined, um, the top kether I have placed as um, Neptune because it's the place of the, um, the womb state of coming in uh, to form. Um, what the ancients did not have, the outer planets, but the one which is Hokma is uh, on the, the gray is Uranus. Um, and then across is Saturn. And Again, back to the great mother imagery in the patriarchal systems, Saturn um, is very different than in the esoteric system where it becomes the feminine and the creator and destroyer of form. Now, these, this archetypal pattern at the top um, is repeated downward. So from Saturn, we go across to the blue, which is um, Jupiter and then across to the red, which is Mars. Um, Mars is connected to, just for example, the separation phase. Um, and then, of course, the gold of Tiferet, which is beauty, and the, the central key unifier. Um, and then down, the green is Venus. Now we're in the realm of the astral. Um, I don't know if this is meaningful. Um, and then across to Mercury, and then into the Moon. So it's lunar, and then to Earth. So if you go up the middle pillar, what you see is Earth, Moon, Sun, and then the one, the one light. 
So I'm going to move forward from here because I'm sure I'll repeat myself. This is just a diagram um, that gives us a sense of how the energy moves. And of course, the serpent. Um, so, um, and it reminds me of this quote by Jung, um, the right way to wholeness is made up of fateful detours and wrong turnings. It is a longissima via, not straight but snake-like, a path that unites the opposites in the uh, manner of the guiding caduceus, a path whose labyrinthine twists and turns are not lacking in terror. So, so this is the tree of life, ascending and descending paths, there and back again. Um, so the original story in the Garden of Eden, we start at the top, we were, that's the lightning path, where, where kind of the, the energy, it's, it's sometimes, um, you can see an image of a sword, and it is, you know, if you had an experience, not uh, of instant enlightenment or an explosion of awakening, it would look like that. Um, the occultists um, tend to go the other way, um, which is a slower process and is more of the yin, the feminine, which is the serpent path. And the serpent path winds around through all of these spheres, through the, the chakra system, and through our many initiations. Um, it's a slow process, can take lifetimes, <laughs> but it's the path that um, hopefully we are taking. The lightning path is not the one that we want um, to um, knock us out right now. <laughs> So, um, Dion Fortune, who wrote the mystical Kabbalah, says of the tree that it is a glyph, that is to say, a com composite symbol which is intended to represent the cosmos in its entirety and the soul of man as it relates. And the more we study it, the more we see that it is an amazing, adequate representation. We use it as an engineer or a mathematician uses his slide rule, to scan and calculate the intricacies of existence, visible and invisible, in external nature, or the hidden depth of soul. The ten circles arranged in a specific pattern and connected by a series of uh, ten lines represent this glyph. The ten circles represent ten divine emanations called the sephira, plural of the word sephira, and the lines symbolize paths that connect the individual sephira to one another. Um, this is where this path is different than the traditional Hebrew Kabbalah, simply because we use um, the tarot, um, which is a pictorial um, set of images that lit, especially the major arcana, which used to be called trump cards in other days, um, <laughs> um, represent these initiatory pathways that we take. Um, so this is another image of the serpent path. And here you can see what um, I think, Brant, you had brought up. The center of the tree are the two triangles of the Sea of Solomon, which is the fire triangle, the masculine meeting, coming together with the feminine, which is water. Um, and you can see, well, the, um, as we, we move down, these, uh, the pineal gland, which see, seems to be here in the place of what we have doth. Um, and then as we move down the cube, when we come closer to ground. Uh, uh, so, so this is an image which basically encompasses all of it. It's by Jofra um, Boschart, who I believe died in 1977. He was more known for his astrological uh, cards, symbology, art, but it is an image of the tree and of the way the entire uh, mo thing moves. And you can see that on the left-hand side with the moon overhead is, is the feminine, the great mother. And you can see 
how that she is the creator and destroyer of form, there's a doorway and all these souls going through. But significantly, you also see the, the circle, the sphere, the triangle as mediator, and the cube um, as matter. And then on the left-hand side, we see the great father with sun overhead. And in the center, and of course, is Mercurius. Um, and Mercurius is the mediator. Um, he is the duplex god, the trickster, the masculine and feminine come together. Um, you can see, as above, so below, very clear. And the sun in the center of his chest with the caduceus flowing up with the birth of the divine child um, coming out of the crown. And then coming back down below, because I never do anything in a straight line, excuse me, <laughs> uh, is the, the feminine coming, pointing back down to matter and the rivers behind her. Um, and the lunar overhead. So you can see the tree depicted um, in this. Um, the present issues. This is from Hermes Trismegistus, the Corpus Hermeticum. The present issues from the past and the future from the present. Everything is made by one by its continuity. Time is like a circle where all the points are so linked that one cannot say it where it begins or ends for all points proceed and follow one another. And then from Jung, from Psychology and Alchemy, when the alchemist speaks of Mercurius, on the face of it, he means Quicksilver, Mercury. But inwardly, he means the world creating spirit concealed or imprisoned in matter. The dragon is probably oldest pictorial symbol in alchemy, of which we have documentary evidence. It appears as the Ouroboros, the tail eater. Uh, the Codex Marcianus, which dates from the 10th or 11th century, together with the legend of the one, the all. Time and again, the alchemists reiterate the opus proceeds from the one and leads back to the one. So when we come down to Earth, then we make the journey up again to the other realms, and it's a circle. Um, um, so to continue, Mercurius stands at the beginning and the end um, of the work. He is the prima materia, the caput corvi, the negredo. As dragon, he devours himself, and as dragon, he dies to rise again in the lapis. He is the play of colors in the cado pavonis, um, which is, um, and the division into the four elements. He is the hermaphrodite and was in the beginning that splits into the classical brother-sister duality and is reunited in the Cuneoctio to appear once again at the end in the radiant form of the lumen novum, the stone. And there's our quaternity. He is metallic yet liquid, matter yet spirit, cold yet fiery, poison and yet healing drought a symbol uniting all the opposites. And for the alchemist, the one primarily in need of redemption is not man, but the deity who is lost and sleeping in matter, who is Hermes Mercurius. So, so much there to continue. Um, so this is just a diagram, which is no longer necessarily accurate, but it's so something to focus on, because I use the tree as a map um, um, I came in through the back door. I'm not a Jungian analyst. I, and so I was studying the occultists and uh, astrology and uh, Tarot long before I came to Jung. And I had an opportunity to teach Jung at J John F. Kennedy. And um, so I had overprepared and I, need, and I was in search of a map. And so I. I basically said a little prayer as I walked up the stairs and I drew the tree on the board and I, the class came through the tree, which at the end of it, we were all literally electrified and thought, okay, Jung definitely worked with the tree. <laughs> so now I have to go back and 
look even deeper. And so Anima Anonymous, of course, uh, Jeff, you, you know, <laughs> some of you know, it's actually uh, in the upper realm of spirit. It's in the first triangle. And then as we move down into the collective, um, you can, but it's, it's never less an over, shadow is also, of course, on both sides. There's actually a, a darker, another side of the, of the tree, um, which is, the, is dark. But it gives you an overall view of the psyche, the psych psychological aspect of. So, so there's Jung working with the tree, which I wasn't aware of at the time. And the fall in the spiral journey, the downward or the upward, here we go. <laughs> and there's the alchemist between the worlds. We can see um, we are now, um, there's a, a opening, the door, the door is opened, and um, we're drawing from both this world and, and, and that. Um, again, uh, another of Jung's images, very familiar to us from the Red Book, but you can see, again, this, the tree um, right there, the serpent at the bottom, the, the um, really, really raw, the, the, the serpent plus these um, uh, instinctual um, uh, creatures, <laughs> and then the roots of the tree, and then the coming up, where you can see the illumination that's coming from the, the star realm here. We all, and moving forward, um, this of course is much older, from the 16th century, and um, here we have the entire, um, um, the, there's the stars, that, uh, and there is the entire zodiac. And in the center, in the triangle, in the center of that circle, is, the, is Mercurius. So he, Mercurius, descends through the tree and also comes back up. And there we have our garden, the tree of knowledge, and the angels overhead. So it's, okay, moving forward. Um, the, Cadu the, not the Caduceus, the Ouroboros, the snake eating its tail. The, another symbol for the um, for Mercurius. This goes back. It's not that old to the 17th, 18th century alchemical symbol. Um, and the circle. The circle. The alpha. The omega. The infinite. That which is beginning and has no end. And symbol for oxygen. So here's, now I'm moving more and more into the, into the symbols. So spirit being the circle, the soul, mediator, um, mediated by Mercurius, Hermes, and matter, the cube of space. And here's the alchemist um, trying to square the circle. So what is squaring the circle? Um, it, I think I was on the right track when it finally it was sort of an epiphany when I realized, oh, squaring the circle means how do we bring the spirit, how do we bring the infinite into the material, how do we bring spirit into matter. And the mediator, again, this triangle can only be the soul. <laughs> so so um, some of you are familiar with this, here we have the uh, triangle, and this is, again, to the alchemist, really significant because it is the one in four. And so you have the three, the three corners. Uh, apparently, the two sides um, correspond to um, uh, fire, which is sulfur. The top, again, is mercurius, and mercurius is both metal and, and liquid. And so it's Mercury is the transformer and the, and the mediator a metaphor. And um, 
the entire thing in its entirety becomes the quaternity, the four, the landing in matter. And at the same time, it's also the one. So something to play with. The hidden, that four is hidden within the transcendent third. The transcendent third, um, of course, you know, the tension of the opposites that we're struggling with between spirit and matter, between the dark and light, between sickness and health, between all of these opposites that we do experience in bodies um, come together um, in the one, in the four, in, uh, at the apex of the triangle. The, excuse me, the three. So I hope that makes sense. Here we are, Mercurius in the philosopher's egg. Um, so they, this story being, of course, that we, they, the alchemists had to capture Mercurius being Quicksilver and easy, because you, can't, you cannot transform without it, without the presence of this, um, of this very elusive uh, being. And I think I did something here that I wanted to... Um, I was looking, there's, there's a whole chapter on uh, the spirit in the bottle, that you, a fairy tale that Jung retells about uh, capturing Mercurius and how um, gaining um, mastery, because otherwise Mercurius can have his way with you. <laughs> it's very tricky. Um, so um, here we is, the philosopher's egg, the alchemical vessel. The alchemical vessel sealed, because it must be sealed in order for the magic to happen. And this, again, of course, we're in the magical realm. <laughs> And, um, and uh, here the birds uh, betoken spiritualization while the scorching rays of the sun ripen the homunculus in the, ve the vessel. So the homunculus in the vessel is again mercurius in physical form. Okay. Um, again, this um, image, which is an alchemical image, is similar. Again, we can see um, the dew drops, the fire. I've used the sun and the moon, the marriage of the sun and the moon. And what we, what we see here is um, that bird is the phoenix, and it is in this realm of Doth. That's why I, I didn't mention it, and I ought to have, that I know Pluto is no longer considered a planet, but in alchemy it is. <laughs> so... Um, you have the phoenix energy um, in this passageway. The, this is the initiation that we go through, um, both in being born and dying, and of course through all our psychological and uh, initiations. And that is a symbol for uh, sulfur, which is fire, mercurius below it, and we land in the cube, the cube of space on Earth. And the same, and, and again, there isn't time. How much time do I have? Oh, I have no time. I have time to finish. Okay, um, okay, so I'm going to fly through because you know that the Negredo is the death and the Albedo. Now we know this triangle, the whitening to allow the spirit in, and then we have to go through this process where we ground it, and it is in the Rubedo on the square that it gets rounded. I think. These are a lot of images of cubes. Here we go. And the homunculus right in the middle with Mercury in the center on Jung's, Jung's uh, stone outside his house. And this image just brings the whole thing into, um, you can see uh, the, not only the planetary elements uh, elemental energies, but you can also see the square and the circle. And then these are images. This is what the redemption might look like, spirit and matter. Um, and again, this is Jofra Boss chart, and perhaps um, I don't have time to get into it, but just take it in for a moment. Um, it is the Unio Mystica, is triptych. And you can see the tree within 
in this. And I pulled this out because we were talking about the Immaculate Conception, about that dove of peace drawing upwards, drawing the feminine towards it. And, uh, and then this I added because from Rilke, isn't it time that loving we freed ourselves from the beloved and trembling endured as the arrow endures the bow so as to be in its flight something more than itself for staying is nowhere. And ultimately this opening to love is perhaps the redemption through the soul and finally the anima mundi <laughs> arriving um, spirit and matter, the final, uh, the final card in the major arcana in Tarot, and it is relegated to Saturn, again, which is the feminine made manifest on Earth. Thank you. <laughs> disappeared again yes one question yeah yes. I mean, you, you have said you do tarot readings I do is that correct? well I, I use tarot in two ways the major arcana is a meditation tool um, the 22 cards um, are in a really a, a, a correspond to the in it, the initiation and then the the entire deck, then the 78, I always say, make sure you're playing with a full deck, the 78 cards can be used for divination. Yes. So if, if, if any of us were to be led to have a reading with you, how, how would such a person and how would you prepare for that reading? I don't actually prepare. It's a download. All of this has been a download, which is hard sometimes to put it in. Um, so oftentimes I will just do them because people ask for them, but it's not something I charge money for. It's just something I incorporate into my work um, because it, it draws the archetypal in and sometimes it gives us um, a, another map, a pictorial map. Yeah. This card? It's the universe, the world, the universe. Yeah. This is the thought deck. And the T-H-O-T-H, which is the Aleister Crowley deck. But it's the only deck that um, you know, corresponds to all the astrological information. And it's really, um, it's very accurate. It's pretty accurate <laughs> in terms of understanding the worlds. I do use the Rider deck. <laughs> I also use the Rider Weight. But the Rider Weight deck doesn't have the astrology. So this is, and it's a beautiful deck. I mean, it's, it's an Art Deco deck. It's beautiful. But I use the Rider Weight. I know. Some, <laughs> that's a synchronicity, I guess. Yes, Daniel. I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the difference between the lightning path and what that is and the serpent path mm -hmm. and why it is that we want to be on the, the long one. <laughs> the long and path winding. Path rather than the, the lightning path and the, the, in connection with that, the, the image of the, the serpent, which is very ambivalent in uh, iconography. Of yes, I mean, we could talk about that for a while, yeah. the serpent. Right, and the serpent being, of course, also Mercurius in the Garden of Eden story, and you know, the serpent being uh, um, Kundalini DNA. It's um, all of that, but but that is because it's coming from the earth up. It's is beginning from the earth and coming up this way. You know, this dance of the Caduceus this way, as opposed to when the lightning path. It could be an atomic bomb, right? <laughs> So it could be a flash. It's a flash. It can also be a moment of enlightenment, but it depends on what level. There are four, as 
some of you who know, study Kabbalah know there are four trees, one on top of the other. Um, we're mostly working with the bottom two, the psychological and physical. So just to play devil's advocate for a moment, Rudolf Steiner, for instance, um, you know, had said that the raising of the Kundalini upwards was the old yogic path inherited from India and so forth, and that the modern anthroposophical way was to bring the spirit from the thinking, the consciousness, down into the, the body. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just, it seems to me the lightning, the, the path from bringing up and down doesn't have to be just a right. inflationary flash of lightning right. that's, that's, that's yeah. fun, and I wonder if you don't need both. Well, maybe you do, because the truth is that once you get to the bottom, if you, you've, you still have to do the walk. You right. still have to go back up. So if you have a, a flash of, you know, as you said, enlightenment, you still have to walk. Now you have to take that um, consciousness and bring it back up. But certainly, the, um, the, you know, we're moving from unconscious to conscious. Or the, path, the, spar the, the occultists talked about this path because they, they did it, they tried to do it consciously, step by step. The mystics, it said, take the middle path. They just, like you're saying. But the energy does move, moves back and it's, it's the kundalini. You know. Lightning. and descent is um, like basically from Tomberg is talking about like that there's there's a dis there's two two ways we can approach life there's bios and there's zoe and the bios is the kundalini sort of electrical earthen quality of our life which is certainly evident in physicality it's certainly evident in the electromagnetic charge that's in our heart and so on yes so that's the serpent path and we have to unify the serpent path with the lightning which is the spirit inhabiting that. Yes. Yeah. And it's like the, you know, from Aurobindo and the mother, you have this notion of like, what if we could bring, we recognize in, in our cells, there's cellular consciousness. Yes. There's a consciousness that exists animate in the cells. And their function, like, like mitochondria, what do they do? They make ATP. That's what they do. Well, what if you could imbue that making of ATP with consciousness and spirit? And then your mitochondria your, would not be producing ATP only, but they'd be producing spirit imbued ATP. That's lightning path meets serpent path. Yeah, and they do. I mean, as, and you, as you pointed out, that, that seal of Solomon where you get the fire, which is the lightning path, and the water, which is the serpent path, and the body, they meet in perfect balance and they become the star. Um, so, I, yeah, there was a poem, but I, I'll leave it I, too much anyway, <laughs> always. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that uh, uh, just now, Brent. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Aurobindo already, it, uh, you know, incorporated both the, uh, you know, uh, involution, Spirit Involution. descending into matter and re-emerging in the in the inverse order in which it originally, un, you know, enfolded itself. So yeah, beautifully said. Thank you. You know, yeah. and so it's it's already there. It's already there. The the spirit in the matter in the mitochondria. Yeah. Just to add a little humor, um, <laughs> at, at, at a Zen talk one day, someone asked uh, the Roshi about sudden enlightenment. And he said, yes, there is sudden enlightenment, but you sit on the cushion. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so both are true. And I mean, if you think of this cosmologically, yes. you know, it's, it is cosmological, yes. and it's cellular, physical, and it's psychological, and they're all they're all interconnected. It's all one thing, right? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so this is one day. <laughs>